Hello everyone, hi and welcome to the Flying Changes show. I'm Jenny Winterleach and I am joined today by the lovely, the gorgeous, the wonderful Mia Rodley. Hi Mia. Hello, that was really lovely. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're you. welcome. <laughs> so uh, Mia, you have a wonderful story and fabulous stuff that you do. So tell us just a little bit about um, what it is that you do and then we'll find out more about how you came to do it. Cool, well, um, Day to day, my life is pretty standard uh, with horses. Like we have every day, I always say my day starts with mucking out and finishes with mucking out. So it's very humbling. Um, but day to day, I do a lot of teaching. I really focus on training my own team of performance horses, whether that's with um, like backing the youngsters, um, the liberty work individually, liberty team, um, kind of helping them get confident in certain situations so anytime the pub's got something on down the road all the horses come and get patted by the kids and see all the see everything that's going on as well so any opportunity can be a training opportunity um and i take in a couple of training horses every month as well just to help some students who might have any issues stuff like problem solving like recently i've had one that's come in because it rears up and flips over backwards which is never much fun um to kind of unwind and see where that problem has come from obviously first checking that there are no physical problems um but this horse is doing really well so um teaching training training other horses and more recently i've started now uh kind of doing more with the film work so stunt doubling i've actually got i don't know if you guys can see but my hair's a bit pink today because uh, it was sprayed ginger yesterday for, for a job and it's got to be blonde again by Thursday so we'll see if it actually washes out like they said it would um but yeah so day to day um I just really focus on um kind of developing myself learning as much as I can from the horses that I see every day and uh, and teaching because there's so much you can learn from teaching and seeing each student and horse um every day and their progression what works what doesn't work if you can come at it a different way um and really trying to get the message across so um i'm someone that if what i said hasn't kind of resonated or sunk in with the student i'll uh, say it a million different ways to try and get this message across and as anyone who knows me knows i love like um oh, what do they call them it's, Oh, I can't remember, but it's where you say, oh, like this in this situation. Metaphors. What's that? Metaphors. Metaphors. Yeah. Yeah. Those, it. those it's things. a bit like this. It's a bit like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love a metaphor, um, but often if I haven't got the metaphor down before I start telling it, it comes out a bit funny and I end up mixing <laughs> things up. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's ever listened to some of my lives they'll hear I start on a metaphor and they go oh, don't know where I'm going with this one <laughs> yeah. okay so yeah so you're so you're a coach you're a trainer you're a teacher you work a bit in film work you do liberty work what's your kind of real what's your real passion what's your what what's your angle I suppose that's an awful way of putting it isn't it but what makes you unique well I guess um my passion for liberty more than um everything else and I've always loved shows and I love real life performance shows as well I forgot to mention that but they're very few and far between really but they're the highlight of my year every year um, anytime we get some shows and we really want to push a bit more in that direction but day to day it's just uh, teaching and training and um, I guess oh I haven't been asked the question what makes me unique um, so that's a funny one uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not very different from anyone else in a way. Um, but it's Mia, it's how just can you not... say that? How can you What's... say you're not different from anyone else? I only met you over a year ago, just <laughs> over a year ago now, and I'd say you're different from most of the people that I know with horses. Oh, Do you want me to tell you why you're unique? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just the kid that never grew up. So um Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um running around with my ponies in the field and then taking it into now actually my real life job and um, performance as well is is the dream and I guess when I was younger I really wanted to have that connection and that relationship with my horses where I could go anywhere do anything and I didn't actually have to 
physically have hold of them they just want to be with me um and just be my friends like it's it's that real inner child thing of having your horse be your best friend and want to be with you um and also having to learn so much about the psychology for that to happen um has been my life really up until now so and continues to be really because it's never ending um but i guess um i've now really got a strong system of bringing what I've learned to um, everyday horses and horse riders and owners um, who want to have that little piece of connection as well. So whether they're high level competition riders, young horses in for training, or just like our lovely ladies who just in, enjoy riding club activities, um, they all want to have that connection with horses and I really think that's how most people get into our industry or the sport or you know the rec recreational side of things is the connection that you have with this animal yeah. um so any rider from any background um is drawn to capturing the horse's mind because as we all know you've got to have your horse's mind on side for them to do what you want them to do physically when you're riding or if you're on the ground I know loads of people who can't trot their horses up for the vet um, you know we, we physically want to make them do something but if our horse's mind isn't with us or thinking in the same way we want was a phone call coming in ah, sorry i'm right. on my phone here because the ipads died awesome um but yeah so i guess what makes me unique now is that i'm able to bring liberty to everyone which is awesome. my passion amazing i love yeah. that so liberty then um we're going to get on to the ins and outs of this later, actually. What I want to know before we do, and you mentioned it earlier, is that since you were a little girl, you just wanted to play with ponies and that you've never really grown up from that. You're like a female Peter Pan. <laughs> <laughs> we call it Patricia Pan. Pan. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your backstory, your reason for why you are where you are today. Where did it, where did it all come from? Well, um... I've loved horses since I was a child, obviously, uh, as we all do. And um, but my horse, uh, my family, sorry, are not horsey at all. Um, none of them know anything about horses. They might have had the odd riding lesson. My granddad actually owns a stables, but has no idea about horses whatsoever. Um, he wouldn't know if one's dead if it was lying down <laughs> sort of thing. Um, but I was very lucky that my fairy godmother um saw my interest and really helped sculpt it so she paid for me to have riding school uh lessons um and then as I started getting more and more hooked I'd do the whole work 10 Saturdays um and you'll get one free lesson so I was really hands-on I was really um into it and dedicated and all I wanted to do was be at the stables so I started very traditionally and um I was always curious of, um, you know, again, the connection that you can have with the horses. And I'd seen Jean-Francois Pignon at Olympia and Hoyes and Lorenzo um, and Frederick Pignon from a little child. And I had posters of them up in my bedroom. My bedroom was just plastered in horsey posters um, of these phenomenal Liberty horsemen and women. And um, so... That's always been the dream, and uh, including the Roman riding. And my brother brought it up, brought it up the other day because I've kind of done that as a, my own little physical challenge. But um, he was like, "Oh no, no, you had posters of Lorenzo in your room, and he's the world famous Roman rider uh, with his huge team of Liberty horses." So um, when I was thirteen, I was at home watching TV as you do, and it's Horse and Country TV, of course. And I saw Pirelli Live Your Dream. And it was Rachel Morland galloping bareback and bridleless down the beach on her Arabian, playing at Liberty. And she was inspired by the book, The Black Stallion, which I also loved. Um, and again, it was about a little boy and this 
poor stranded on, on a desert island and they were forced to communicate to survive. And that's how they built this phenomenal connection that then took them off around the world. And it, it couldn't be broken no matter what situation they were put in. I loved that. That was like me hooked from that moment on. So I learned everything I could um, through the Pirelli home study system. And as I was a teenager, I was very lucky to then start going to watching clinics and again, reading every book, watching every DVD, um, completely immersing myself in it. It was the only thing I could think about. And um, and I was just mad about it, really. So um, then going on from there, I started having lessons. I then got my own horses and I started having lessons with my own horses with Liz and Sean Coleman, who then became my bosses because I left school and immediately started a working student there where I completely, again, immersed and dedicated myself to my time there, very rarely taking any days off um, and just learnt and watched as much as I could and did as much as I could. Um, because the more you do, the more you fail and the more you fail, the more you learn. So that's what I did as well. So it's uh, and it was tough because my family, again, being not horsey really didn't understand this weird addiction that I'd had and they don't really have a passion um, or hobbies per se themselves so they were like what is this what is this thing that Mia's got hooked onto this is so weird um, and so you know I, I did I lived in a caravan for four years uh, which was really cold in the winters and um, and you know, it, it was tough. It was really hard, um, but I loved it. And there was so much um, personal growth and development in those few years, being a working student, being guided and led by Liz and Sean and the Pirelli Network as well, because the community in that program was uh, phenomenally strong. And then I was really lucky um, that Pat Pirelli himself came to the UK. I groomed for him for a few days and he gave me the opportunity to have a full scholarship to come out to America um, and learn from him, Linda, and the other amazing instructors there. And Pat has learned everything he's learned from, again, great um, horsemen, women around the world and horses themselves. He's just spent hours watching herd behaviour and has put that into a program that's so easily accessible for everyone um, and a real step-by-step -step foundational program, which is excellent. Um, so that's really my background was completely in Pirelli. And I was then also very lucky to meet other superb horsemen and women from that. Having a really strong foundation uh, myself and my horses meant that we could just spiral off into any direction we wanted and actually hold our own which was really nice because my horses were calm confident connected they trusted my leadership um so anything i threw at them they write they always rise up to the challenge which is really special um and that uh, and it still still happens to this day as well uh which is lovely so um I have so many people to thank for helping me on my journey to where I am now. And um, I'm not sure if I said it to you when I last saw you, but um, I'd be really happy if I died now in a tragic accident, you know. But um, I've kind of achieved all the dreams that Little Mia wanted with horses. So anything from here on out now is a bonus. Um, and and it's just great really I'm, I'm really really happy and I love what I do and love my horses and it's just couldn't be better amazing and what an incredible thing to be able to say <clears throat> and how old are you Mia 24 at 24 like actually <laughs> do you know what I'd be really happy if this was it like if if this was it I'd be really happy there must be a part of you that now goes, OK, so what's next, though? There must yeah. be. I know there's a bit of you that wants more. Of course, there is. I know you. I train with you. <laughs> <laughs> not as yeah. a teacher, but together on the squads. And so what um, what is next? What would you love? What does Big Mia want? Little Mia's <laughs> dreams have been achieved. What does Big Mia want? Um, I just want to achieve excellence with my horses, really, and be an excellent rider, an excellent leader for them. 
I'd love to perform worldwide one day with my beautiful team of amazing horses. Um, I'd love, you know, you and I receive class quality training uh, from Paolo, who's a phenomenal dressage rider. And I, I love how he helps um, me and my body and how that helps my horse um, on their back, because I've kind of got it on the ground now. Um, and, you know, obviously still exploring that, but ridden um, has always been my weaker side of um, kind of horse training. So uh, the old saying, good, better, best, never let it rest until your good is better and your better is best. Um, I just want everything I have now, but better. So um, more refined, um, higher quality. I want to go as high as I can in dressage um, because you find real harmony and it's true communication and like a, um, again, it's taking that connection with your horse, but ridden and seeing if you can influence their body um, it, to move in a better way, in a more healthy way and perform really athletic and gymnastic manoeuvres without any tension. Um, that's a real challenge for me um and for all of us really you know that's the never-ending um challenge so big mirror i guess the ultimate dream as i've said would be like perform worldwide with a great team of liberty horses i'd love to do bridalist dressage one day like have my horse have that much self-carriage and confidence in their body and me as a rider that we could do tempi changes bridalist and pirouettes and piaf and passage that would be amazing um and i feel like I, I get a little taste of it every time i have a lesson i'm like oh yeah i can feel where this can go um and, and then for liberty i'd love to have a bigger liberty team but um the restrictions on that is not having too many horses because i do have quite a few horses and it is expensive to keep them all <laughs> um so i I can't make it too much bigger without um, uh, bankrupting myself. <laughs> so, and then the whole dream has to stop. Um, and then really just helping and inspiring as many people as possible, because I was the little girl who was totally awe inspired by these phenomenal professionals with their horses. Um, and that spurred on the next generation of horsemen and women who are like challenging um, how far it can go. It's it's really um, amazing. And we've got some phenomenal people who are, you know, my age at the moment who are really pushing and trying to experiment and see and, uh, you know, whilst maintaining that relationship with their horses. It's really, really uh, fun and fascinating, really. Sorry, oh, I'm kind awesome. of blabbering on about no, it. No, no, it's great. No, well, you're just passionately chatting about what you love and what you <laughs> want and, and think, and it's, I think it's lovely. So I'm going to interrupt there because <clears throat> I had a really great question for you that has completely gone. Um, <laughs> right, no, I know what it was. I know what it was. Okay, so you've talked about um, you need to have the horse's mind on side, and that is absolutely like the, the epitome of what you and I do together is you've got to have your mind able to do what you want to do and in the right place but if your horse's mind isn't then you know and vice versa so tell us mm. a little bit about um the horse's mind and what fascinates you about it the most and what it is about having them on side and on board and connected that that you love and and anything that you want to share about that sort of side of what you do because actually if there is no bridle there is no saddle there's no spurs there's no whip there's no bit there's none of that stuff and the communication has to come, then that horse could say, bog off, thanks very much, I'm not interested. So how do you yeah. get it to that point where it goes, oh, yeah, okay, I'll listen to what you're saying and what you're doing? Obviously, that is quite a lot of information, how do you get it to that point? But what, yeah, yeah. what is the essence of it for you? That's a great question, and I really love that. And, you know, horses are natural followers looking for natural leaders. It's very rare you meet a horse that really wants to be the herd leader. Um, very similar to, I say it's a metaphor, very similar to CEOs. Um, it takes a real type of person to be a CEO, to want to lead that number of people, um, you know, because on that you have all the responsibility of the herd, um, and protection and 
food and water you know it's it's rare to meet a herd leader but there are they are around i'd say it's maybe only one percent of horses though really want to be a herd leader so they are looking for uh natural leaders natural followers looking for natural leaders and that kind of ties in really well with what you jenny um because you have to learn how to be a leader and how to be a leader for a horse is very similar in how to be a leader for a human which is why there have been so many programs where you know corporate companies come and learn the basics of horsemanship um to uh, learn to be better leaders for their corporate companies and how to be a better leader for the horse so um you know horses seek safety comfort and play and then food in that order so if they don't feel safe or comfortable they're not looking to play or eat and play um in the herd is dominance games and play in our world is a training frame of mind so if the horse isn't comfortable safe confident they don't learn really you can get stuff done uh but it it doesn't empower the horse in any way so they have to feel safe and comfortable both with you in their environment and what they're learning to then be in a training frame of mind uh, for them to actually learn and for you to teach anything. Um, and that's also why if a horse doesn't feel safe or comfortable, they don't eat. Um, and that's where you can get really stressy horses at box walk and eat and because their needs of safety and comfort haven't been met because they're either not in a herd green we go no yes sorry my screen went there so i'll just repeat that um so if a horse's needs aren't being met which is safety comfort first um you know if they feel like they have to be the herd leader um or um and they're not and they're not confident enough to be that it can cause a great deal of anxiety in the horse so they need a, a more a stronger more dominant herd leader to, for them to actually feel safe and calm which is the story with a lot of horse and rider combinations if their horse is stressy or scared um or it's being argumentative it's usually because it doesn't trust your leadership and usually they don't trust your leadership because they know that you don't trust your leadership um and that's a really hard like truth to face when your horse goes you're not okay and i don't trust you that is like really hard to swallow and that often comes up in high pressure situations that we put ourselves in like shows like competitions uh anytime you're asking your horse to perform it might be in a lesson because you feel uh unconfident or um anxious about your lesson and the training so Anytime you don't feel okay, the horse goes, oh, if you don't think you're okay, I don't think you're okay. And my life is on the line. And horses being prey animals, they do still have that very strong innate instinct of uh, fight and flight and fear. And not just, oh, scary. It's like fear for their lives. If they don't trust your leadership, um, they could end up dead. And that's really heavy. Yeah. Um, actually. And I see that a lot in her in herd behavior, in my herd of horses, um, with horse and human combinations. So you've um got to be very strong in your own mind and confident because the horse knows if you know, and the horse knows if you don't know. And it's not that they can smell fear, it's not, you know, that that they just can tell and it's intention a lot of the time and a horse can tell what you're thinking and feeling like 40 feet away from before you've even got to your horse if you've got the head collar in your hand and you're opening the gate to catch them from the paddock they know what you're thinking they know what you're feeling and i do believe that horses can read our minds but not in the sense they can't see the chitter chatter that's kind of going on uh, they see the pictures that you're painting in your mind. And that's um, also what I use as 
a training tool because I go picture your perfect picture with your horse and sure enough it usually happens if you picture the worst possible picture uh, that usually happens too so if you go oh I'm hacking out and oh there's this grassy hill and oh he might buck and I'll fall off hey presto it happens whereas if you go oh here's a lovely grassy hill let's go for a nice canter and it's the birds are singing and the sun is shining oh let's have a lovely time together um, that happens. So again, it's kind of setting your intentions because horses being prey animals, they are designed to read a predator's thoughts and intentions because we've all seen that picture of the zebra grazing next to a sleeping pride of lions. And we go, why are the zebra so close to the lions? Don't they know they could be killed and eaten? Of course they know that, but they're reading the lion's thoughts and intentions. And right now the lions aren't interested in hunting. They're interested in sleeping. So that's a prime example. And then the minute the lion's intention changes, the zebra are out of there. You know, they're, they're not going to get killed and eaten today. So mm. um, we have to know that horses really, really know. They're not silly. They're not stupid. Um, and we can't lie to ourselves. Yes. Um, because they can pick that up too. Okay. So you've, you know, so much of it is personal development. And I've had to really embrace that as well um, in my learning and my progression. And it is never ending. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> it yes, goes on forever. <laughs> the moment you think you're getting good, it, it all goes to pot again. And then you reach a new level of conscious incompetence. So, yep. It just keeps on going. It does. Uh, but you've really got to learn to love that feeling of learning and progression um, and getting it wrong because it doesn't matter if you get it wrong. Luckily, horses are so forgiving, unbelievably forgiving. And it is actually very easy to reprogram a horse out of habits. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I kind of get a, almost a little bit too logical with this, but it takes a horse three to seven times to learn something, whether that's a good pattern or a bad pattern. So if your horse has napped to the gate three times in one session, it's now learned it can nap to the gate uh, with you riding. And, you know, I'm trying to use a, a scenario that a lot of us have come across or seen at least. So as a trainer, if you then call your trainer to come and help you solve this napping problem, the trainer now has to get the horse to not nap to the gate six times in the next session. So six or seven times I'd say so at least more than double what the horse has presented the behavior um to reprogram and reset the behavior that they're displaying in the arena um same thing for like if a horse accidentally learns to rear because it does happen you know um as nice as we try to be some riders don't have the bearing and can accidentally teach their horses to rear. So if the horse rears four times in one session, you've then got to make sure it doesn't rear eight times presented in the same scenario uh, in the next session. So you reprogram that behavior. Um, and then same with trailer loading. Like that's a problem so many of us have come across. Often I'll get a phone call like, oh, we've waited for an hour and a half um, and the horse still won't load. So we've put, we've gone had a cup of tea put the horse back in the stable so the horse has learned it only has to out persist the human for an hour and a half so i go oh it'll probably take me about two hours and they go how do you know that and usually one hour and 35 minutes the horse then loads so you've literally only got to out persist the horse a tiny bit longer than the human has previously before to you know interrupt a pattern or a behavior um so that's just a tiny bit of psychology and horse training. And I could waffle on about that oh, all day. Um, we, could, we could do hours and hours of this one, couldn't we? Oh, yes. One question I do have for you, because this comes up obviously a lot in what I do, and I'd be fascinated to hear your thoughts about it, is people always say to me, oh, you know, but my horse will pick up on my fear. And in actual fact, I had a client ask me about this the other day. She's done my mastermind program. She's had great results from it. And things. She's now got a new horse and it's totally new to her. She's had a break from horses for a long time. And she's like, she's doing all the groundwork. She's loving it. She's getting all the trust and things like that. And she's like, I've actually got to sit on it now. Like, you yeah. know, this is the next step. She said, but I am nervous and I'm fearful, but I need to sit on it. But I'm really worried it's going to pick up on my nerves. And my answer to her was, well, look, you're going to have to sit on it at some point and it might pick up on your nerves. But the only way to do it is to do it. So this is that yeah. point now of you've got to do it. Leap of faith. But 
And that's exactly it. But there's yeah. so many people that get stuck in this concept of, of but my horse knows if yeah. I'm fearful. Well, they do. You've just been entirely saying, yes, they do. And you can't fake it. There's no fake it no. to make it. That really annoys me, that phrase in horses. Yeah. There are things you can do to trick your brain that yes. help you, but you cannot fake confidence because your horse is going, well, you're not, are you? Like, yeah. come on, that, that's bravado. I can tell that. What would you say to people that are in that situation where, you know, they're saying, oh, my horse knows I'm not, I'm not okay. But actually, you know, they've done everything they can do to get to that point and they want to build a ridden relationship because it is often the riding that's more fearful than the in hand work, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, not always. I know a lot of people that would much, much rather be on a horse than in hand. But what would you say to someone that's, that that has this concept of, but my horse picks up on the fear, but I need to do the thing I need to do? That's hard. Um, again, I would say picture your perfect picture before you take the leap of faith. So really have that super clear in your mind. So you put your foot in your stirrup, you picture yourself being calm, relaxed, confident, you can talk it out if you need to. Um, say, I am calm, I am confident, I am a leader, my horse is happy, my horse is safe, my horse is comfortable, uh, my horse is calm, my horse is confident. You know, you can verbalise it if you need to. Um, put your foot in the stirrup and, and get on with, um, I mean, I know you, you say you can't fake it till you make it. Um, but as much as you can in your body language, try to behave confident um, because that can help your, I know you'll say this a lot better than I can, but if you try to behave confident, um, your, I guess your brain will, um, it will feel more confidence as well. I, I know you can explain yeah, that you're, part No, better. you're entirely right. Yeah, yeah, but from the is, human perspective. What about from the horse's perspective? From though? the horse's perspective... Hmm. In that moment, I guess they'll be going, oh, what's going on? This is different. This is new. And you've got to uh, try and uh, I guess it is all in you in this moment in time. Um, and that's that's hard in if you're not a professional, if you're not a trainer, if you've not done the work um, that you need to do in your own mind to be a leader. But the horse needs a moment of confidence as well from you. Um, you can't leave it up to your horse um, in that moment. You've got to step up for them. Um, they need to know that they're safe, that they're comfortable and that they're in that play and training frame of mind uh, to learn and have a good time. And every time you can have a more positive experience, obviously the better it gets. Um, oh, so yeah, in the horse's mind, I mean, I wouldn't be stepping my foot in the stirrup until I know that the horse is calm, confident, connected and relaxed on the ground. And I often don't get on a horse until it's blown out that noise um, before I get on a, a, an unknown horse. Um, that blowing out is a real release of tension, adrenaline, um, of mental, emotional and physical tension. Um, anyone who's watched like equine massage or done release therapies will know that you're reading the horse's body language for these more positive behaviours, more behaviours showing relaxation. So I'm looking for a horse that's got its head low, um, a soft neck, blinking. If they're blinking, they're thinking. If they're not, they're hot. You don't want a starey eyed bracy horse that's holding its breath. You want one that's relaxed, blinking, breathing, has blown out, maybe licking its lips, yawning's even better. Um, that's the picture of the horse I would want before I get on. And now there's hundreds of different groundwork exercises you can do to achieve that before you get on. Because the chances are, if you get on a horse that is holding tension, whether that's mental, emotional or physical tension, when you get on, it will escalate the numbers. And, uh, you know, if your horse is at a two when it's saddled, um, because there's a little bit of tension coming up, when you step your foot in the stirrup, it's going to a four. When you sit your bum in the saddle, it's gone to a six. And then if you take the first steps away and walk and your horse isn't feeling confident or is holding that tension, suddenly the numbers escalate and that's where things can happen. So it's, I also use the metaphor of using traffic lights. So if my horse is giving me green lights, I'm going to be happy to go on and get on it. If my horse is presenting an orange light, so say its head comes up, 
up the eyes go a bit stary it holds its breath i'm always reading their body language because that's the only way they can communicate <sighs> there we go okay i'll just repeat that just in case you missed it um if my horse's body, horses can only communicate to us through body language. So we have to always be aware and reading and knowing what these signs and signals and what this body language means. Um, if we miss a communication from our horse, that orange light can quickly turn to a red light. So if you're driving up to a set of traffic lights and, it, and the lights are turning orange, and it could be going red. So you need to start backing off and slowing down before that light goes red. Now, if the light's orange and it starts turning green, then you need to put your foot down and start moving forward again. You don't want to be sat at an orange light, otherwise you can get beeped at or, or a green light. So if your horse is giving you all these wonderful, calm, confident, connected behaviors, you've got to go because otherwise they'll get bored or they'll start making up their own fun. That's your green light to progress so if your horse is showing you calm confident connected behaviors i'd say crack on and that should give you confidence that you've done everything you can that you're reading the situation um, to progress because another great saying is fear and frustration comes where knowledge ends now if you can't read the situation um, that your horse is in you know their body language their behavior that will um that can make you fearful because you don't know what's about to happen and my example of that is if i step into a herd of cows i get really scared because i can't read cows and i don't know cow body language if i'm not on a horse and in a herd of cows i'm terrified and i've been chased by cows many times um and that fear is because i I don't have the knowledge to read what the cows are telling me. So because I don't know cow behavior, funnily enough, <laughs> so it's not my yeah. passion. So, yeah. I love that phrase. So what was the phrase? Fear, fear starts where knowledge ends. Fear and frustration comes where knowledge ends. Oh, I love that. Absolutely. There we that. go. Awesome. And we've just had Alice, uh, who is one of our amazing marketing ladies, who says she can give you some cow tips over there, by the way. She's oh, brilliant. Thank you, Alice. That would <laughs> so be really great. Cool. And in fact, Alice isn't only a miles away from you either, because you're at Leicester, aren't you? And she's Nottingham. So there you go. Oh, so okay. maybe yeah, you can have some brilliant. cow time together. If you do, let me know, because I want to come and watch. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm fine with cows on a horse. Yes. No, this cows... will be on the ground. Yeah, on the ground is not okay. Yeah, <laughs> you need to learn cow psychology. Clearly, that's yes. the next part of your learning journey. Cow but yeah, okay. So coming back though to um, fear and frustration are where knowledge ends or start. Yeah. Where knowledge ends. I love that, and that is so true, isn't it? People always talk about the fear of the unknown, but the only way to come out of the unknown is to stretch a little bit to learn. You've yeah. got to dip your toe. You've got to come out the comfort zone to get a little bit into the unknown, but not too far. You don't want to yeah. go too far. You don't want to um, crash if you go through a red light. That's the one. Red light, green light. <laughs> Love it. Um, so um, one of the things that I did want to ask you, though, we're talking about learning. We're talking about mistakes. We talked about the horse side. And thank you for that. It was a really, really useful and interesting point about, um, you know, reading reading your horse. And some horses really are perfectly confident, though, aren't they? They can mm. have someone shaking oh, yeah. with fear on top of them and they don't care because they're just like, no. I'm all right. It's fine. You can they're do like, what you want, love. Don't bother me. Yeah. Yep. And they're great. They're what we call the confidence givers, aren't they? They're oh, fabulous. Yes. The ones who just aren't bothered by it. But, yes. you know, then there's younger horses or different breeds or different types of horses and that's, that have things that's happen. that's very much down to, like, innate behaviour and their background and training. Yeah. Because uh, you have some – like, my horse, Solo, who's the big Irish sports horse, yeah. he is that 1% of herd leader horse, and he is so okay yeah. with everything. Yeah. But his thing is, um, why should I? Because he goes, I'm the boss. <laughs> why should I listen to you? What's yeah. the point? Why would I want to be with you? Yeah. Why would I want to do what you're telling me to do when I can just buck you off and bugger off and do my own thing? Yeah, so, um, I think I might be accidentally training one of those right now. 
I definitely have the everything's fine. I'm all right. Although I think my boy internalizes actually, to be honest. But yeah. most of the time, you've seen him. We've got to done things together, and he's go. Oh, I'm fine, all right. But he's now definitely getting to the point where he goes. That's really difficult. I don't want to do that. Thanks. That's yeah, he's like, I think I'm off. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't need to be doing that. Can't we go and do something fun, please? Okay, yeah. right. So the question I wanted to ask you though is, what has been your greatest learning that's actually turned into your biggest asset in your time? Ooh, in the sense of my horse training or personal development or up to you Both greatest one learning user. yeah yeah your greatest your greatest learning that's turned into your biggest asset in life oh it's a good one that one isn't it that is a really good one i think um it would come down to self-confidence and that was taught to me through uh horses and probably solo um the horse i just spoke about um is a big influencer in that because you can't um make or force or beg that horse to do anything and when you're not self-confident um you are seeking approval um whether it's from people, mine in my case, it was more my horses. So I was like, why doesn't my horse want to be with me? And that really rattled me because uh, I was like, it must be something I'm doing. It must be. And it was, but it, not that I wasn't a nice person or a nice person to be around, but I wasn't a strong enough leader for that horse. And I had to change a lot in myself to become self-confident. And I go, oh, OK, if you don't want to do that, fine. Do what you like. I'm going to carry on doing what I want to do um and you should come with me because it's a lot more fun so really causing my idea to be my horse's idea um and again that's a lot of psychology uh, and horse training yes but the change i had to make in myself was letting go of wanting to um almost make him be with me all the time and want to be with me and i just had to let go of that and be like no i'm fine um you're fine but we could be even better if you want to join in and do what I want to do um, as well. So, um, and again, that's come uh, with my journey in what I chose to do. I had to let go of the kind of uh, beliefs and limitations that I'd been raised with, especially going into the horse industry, because everyone knows you won't make any money and you'll be miserable and working until you're 60 if you choose to do horses, you know. I, I had to let go of that kind of stuff and be like, I'm OK and I'm self-confident enough to let go of those beliefs and still continue to do what I love. And so, yes, Solo was an excellent teacher um, in that for me, but it really related to my personal life as well. And it was obviously a lesson I had to learn um, because it kept getting presented to me with different horses that I had in um with personal life things that were going on I had to learn to let go and still be okay in myself so wow. yeah what an amazing lesson let go and still be okay let go and go with the flow exactly yeah wow incredible trust and they are got what was it trust and I know the trust one say. and um a leap of faith and actually yeah. sorry just a quick one yeah. you remember at the southwest iberian show the squad fairy lights we did this year <laughs> it started with an alan watts um kind of uh he's a philosopher and he kind of studied buddhism and brought it to the western world it started with an alan watts kind of paragraph about dreams he's got another one like that about acts of faith and how everything we do in life is an act of faith because you don't know the next step you take if the ground is going to give way. What an act of faith to be walking, you know, in relationships. What an act of faith. You're giving yourself up. You're letting go. Um, with horses, that's really hard because you have to let go of that sense of control and safety. But also um, know, again, in your own self-confidence that you have the strategies and the tools and the skills that you need to actually be safe. Um, but it is an act of faith. Everything we do in life is an act yep. of faith. Yep. People, I say to people all the time, you'll get in your car and you'll drive somewhere and you don't get in your car thinking, oh my goodness, I might crash today. 
you get yeah. in your car and you drive some but you're you're less safe in your car than you are on your horse oh but, yeah <laughs> you know and it's all because of programming and brains and we could talk about this for days and weeks and hours um oh. years um but yeah you're entirely right everything is an act of faith and sometimes when you just trust and let go uh just trust and let go and just go do you know what i just trust myself and i've always said this about horses sorry you just you have broke to trust... up oh that's okay i'll just keep talking because i think you've broken up again anyway oh you have to trust yourself i'll get you back in a minute it's fine you have to trust yourself you have to trust yourself you have to trust Hello. your decisions you, you'll be back in a minute <laughs> just keep, you keep coming back in oh, you've frozen no. on a really beautiful spot there Mia. i don't know if you can you'll be back in in a minute no doubt might want to pop out and come back in see what happens oh it's um, is it coming back Oh, I can hear you now. You're still, I think oh, I lost go. a lot of that. Yeah, you're back. I'm back. That's okay. I was just filling in time whilst you were disappearing. And I was oh, literally good. just saying, you just have to trust yourself. You have to trust yourself. You have to trust your decisions. You have to trust that the next step is the best next step to take. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. You can't aim for a bigger picture. It's too big. You could aim for it, but you've got to break it back down. And I think that's kind of the concept you've been saying with the horses as well. I think you've frozen again. Yes, you have. Um, is that you can go for something bigger. But you've got to break it down into the little steps and build the trust with them and build the, the the sense of wanting to be with you in the partnership as well. Just going to read a comment out here because I am now filling time because Mia has yet again frozen. And I think she's even messaged me possibly as well. No, she hasn't. Um, to say, light bulb for me. Uh, this is when we were talking about leaders. This is obviously why I struggle with my homebred as a youngster. He sees his mother as the leader and not me and is distracted by her to the point that he scares you because his focus is on her and to get back to her. Yep. I have learned and I'm still learning, of course, to get his focus back on me. And I've also been told it can't be a 50-50 relationship. It has to be 49-51 to me. Um, yeah, 100%. You've got to be the leader. There was a great um, quote by Barack Obama, um, you know, American president. And he said he is constantly having to make decisions that will probably massively impact people's lives. You know, does he go and bomb where Osama bin Laden is and potentially kill other people, but equally, you know, kill the guy that's caused all these problems? Does he go and do that? Or, uh, you know, what does he do? 50-50, like really big, hard decisions. And um, he he said he just has to get to the point where he is 51% certain that if he can get to 51% certain, then as a leader, that 1% is enough because he's never going to get to 100% certain. In fact, 80, 70, 60, anything like that, it's not going to happen. So if he can get to 51% certain, and I think that's a bit like we're talking about with leaders here and horses. If you can get to 51% you and 49 them, that's enough that it's you. I mean, obviously, we'd love it to be more with you as a leader, but just it's not 50-50. It can't be 50-50. Some horses would love it to be 60-40 in their favour, to be honest with you. But the problem with that is, and I'll bring Mia back in now, ah. you've got a 60-40 relationship with your horse where they're taking 60% leadership, you're taking 40. It's all very well, but it comes with its own issues as well, doesn't it? Okay, so um, someone else has said, I experienced the frustration from a trainer which didn't end well, and now I'm on a journey to find the answers myself. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you've got to find find who works for you, haven't you? You've got to find the trainers Definitely. that you resonate with. You've got to have the right knowledge, but you've got to have the right way of putting it across as well. So, Mia, okay. Um, I would love to know, let's do some short, short quick fire questions for you now. Now that you're back. <laughs> okay. Just did some infilling for you then. Talked about leadership um yeah well, what I, has I been 5149 yeah 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 it was probably i think i think i know who the comment was from and i think i've lost oh no you're back um i think it was probably a very well-known guy who's an incredible horseman that probably said that as well i think we've lost you again Mia. excellent you've got to love a little bit of the internet gremlins they have been they're seriously around this week internet gremlins i kid you not every time i've done anything with technology this there. week that has been a gremlin are you back you're back. Are you back? Oh, I think I'm back. You're... you're back. Guess who's back? Back think... again. Me is back. Okay. <laughs> back Short again. Short five questions. <laughs> what is your Let's do it. biggest success in the last year and what has made it so? Ooh, I would say um, the Southwest show, I'd say, because I was competing, which was 
as you know, has been a journey for me this year because I've never competed before this year and that brought up a lot in me. But also performing and uh, performing with my two young horses, Roman riding, who had only Roman ridden a handful of times before that. Uh, that show kind of epitomised some massive successes for me. So competing with Spirit, he was wicked and on fire and performing as well. We were in the fairy lights as well as competing. And then um, performing with the Colts, both at Liberty and Roman Riding. So for me, that's an epitome of a year or two years of training with Spirit for working equitation and uh, my lifetime of, or the Colts lifetime of training since mm. they've been with me. So from 10 months old to three and a half years old, um, I was really pleased really pleased yeah, they were awesome and um am i right in saying that while you were there you that was your first time cantering uh yeah. Roman riding mm, so they gave You're you a right. first at that show as well didn't they yeah <laughs> so and i'd never cantered roman riding because it is pretty scary and i got very used to the trot rhythm cantering's a whole nother step up and i hadn't really had horses that were ready to canter as a pair so uh, i've just been happily trotting along but since the energy like the atmosphere and energy in that arena as you know was just incredible like i've never been faced with an audience like that and neither of the horses and that energy just helped us get going into canter so we just went with it i had to let go just go with it and it was great really loved it awesome Big and there you go perfect example isn't it of where you've just got to trust and let go Trust and let go because you could have tried to pull them up and all sorts, but you'd yeah, probably have more I could problems. Have made them stop, but it would have interrupted, and you know, I wanted to let them kind of like go, go out with it. So yeah, yeah, and that's not something we'd normally suggest is trying something new. But it wasn't a deliberate decision on your part. No. So you had to just do it, didn't you? <laughs> so you got to trust your training at that point. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's something that um, someone was saying on a QA and a the other day is that actually you can go and do all this impressive stuff like Roman riding. So impressive to watch and the tricks and things and the stuff that you do and the and the demonstrations you do and the bridal list and all those things. They're really amazing to watch and people see them and think, wow, that's incredible. Um, how do you get to the point of that much trust? And actually, it's all the work in the background yeah. that means that when you're then performing, if something doesn't go to plan or it's not quite how you're expecting it, you've got that foundation there to exactly. just use. Yeah, exactly. And your horses, have, again, trust your leadership. Um, but it is, like we say, train at 110 and perform at 80. So whether that's uh, like whatever you do, competing or performing, it's the same. Um have that training under your belt and it is the hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of work you put in and i actually had uh, a very traditional jockey come up to me the other day he watched a, a liberty lesson i was giving and he'd seen me perform at blakesley show and he gone what is all this monty roberts rubbish and i went oh well oh such fun so i, I just shut up at this point because i'm not going to change his mind and uh the owner of the horse goes, oh, this is Mia who was at Blakesley show and you, re you were really impressed there. And he went, oh, yeah, but how do you get to that from this? And I went, exactly what we're doing here and now. And he went, no, 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 like, really, how do you get your horses to do that? And I went, exactly what we're doing here and now. Like, this is where it starts, getting connection, getting your horse to stay at your shoulder and walk, trot, stop and back up and turning and, you know, in an arena. Yeah, that's where it's, this is how it, this is truly how it begins. This is exactly what I do with my horse. This is exactly what I'm teaching here. So, yeah, that yeah, was funny. But people, people want the outcome. They want the shortcuts sometimes. So they don't want to put in the hard work. Because, like you say, it makes you face stuff you might not be ready to face. Mm. So if you're going to go into this journey, you've so totally got to go with an open mind that this is going to develop you just as much as it's going to develop your horse and your relationship with them as well. And it's hard not it easy is. if you do what is easy your life will be hard but if you do what is hard your life will be easy the whole me has so many quotes we're, uh, we're um, um my, my girls are watching this and they're gonna be like pulling the quotes out of this like you wouldn't believe social media is gonna explode <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll, we'll uh, credit well we, we could credit them to you but they're not probably probably yours are they sorry no, me. i don't, I don't think you've made I've them up yourself have you <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and so, so we're, we're loving you, Mia. Such wise words. On oh, a huge honour to be on this. Honestly, thank you so much. You're so welcome. And I can't wait to see you at whatever we're at next. Um, this weekend? 
Oh, you're coming to squads? We're at squads together. Well, I'll be there. Okay. Squads. Awesome. Squads. Oh, don't. Just don't. <laughs> um, I wish it was called something else. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, we'll be training together, which will be amazing. Can't wait to uh, share some more thoughts and knowledge with you and have some great discussions again. Mm -hmm. And um, if anyone wants to get hold of you, Mia, how do they do that? Um, best way is probably Facebook and or Instagram. They're kind of my two main platforms. Do just drop a message. I can be rubbish with my admin, um, but I will get back to you at some point. So, um... Okay, what's your Facebook? Because it's uh, not Mia Rodley, is it? Or oh, it is Mia Rodley. Heart of Horsemanship. That's it. The Heart of Horsemanship is your main Facebook page and yes. to get hold of you on, isn't it? Okay, and Instagram? Uh, Mia Rodley. Awesome. Is there an yeah. underscore in there somewhere, I think, maybe? No. It's no, just... there isn't. Oh, there we are. The the only Mia Rodley. <laughs> maybe maybe there's another Mia Rodley I've been following. Then. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? When you get famous, that's what happens. People copy <laughs> you. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Mia. And you're out and about quite a lot this year, aren't you? So people can find out what you're going to and where you're going and what you're doing and hopefully yeah. watch you. And well, I say this year, end of this year, what's left, and then there'll be some exciting stuff next year, isn't there? Loads. Ooh, of Lots of things. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. Stay with me, Mia. We're going to go finish being live now and um, uh, have fun, everyone. Take care and go and have a think about how you can connect even better with your horses. See you. Bye. Bye.